So in this video, I'm going to talk about signal transduction pathways. Those are ways that cells can detect what's going on outside and respond internally appropriately. So uh, one example would be a bacterium in my intestines who's kind of waiting to see what I eat, what kind of food comes down the intestinal tube, and then they'll respond by making the appropriate enzymes to kind of cut up some of what I've been eating. Um, so I hope that makes sense that for all organisms to be able to respond appropriately to what they're sensing and to maybe also it's an advantage because it saves energy, it saves resources so that they only make what they need uh, if that's important kind of in the given environmental context in which they find themselves. So uh, signal transduction pathways are going to be pretty universally conserved across all different species. Some of the same elements and signaling pathways we really see in all kinds of cells. So it's something that's really important um, that we want to cover here. And I don't ever want you to feel like you have to memorize specific pathways. There's going to be a lot of coverage of that in the textbook, and I don't want you to memorize specific names like you're seeing in this diagram here. They're very intimidating looking because they're almost all acronyms. What I want you to be able to do instead, though, is I do want you to be able to talk me through how any general pathway works and to be able to go into these three general steps in some detail. So that's what we're going to cover here in this video and that's what we're going to practice in class. So the first step of any signaling pathway is that the signal from outside has to be received. So let's talk about that. There has to be some kind of receptor protein that fits the signal coming from outside. Any kind of signal that's uh, uh, coming from the environment is called a ligand in general. Oftentimes that's a chemical, so it could be the chemical, um, uh, some of the food actually coming into the bacteria or contacting the bacterial cell that I was talking about earlier. Or in a multicellular organism, it might be chemicals released by other cells. So for example, if I were to release adrenaline throughout my bloodstream, it might change the behavior of all of the cells around my body who need to respond to adrenaline. They'll have adrenaline receptors maybe in their membrane. Uh, so receptor proteins, another really important class of proteins um, to add to our list, including enzymes and transport proteins and motor proteins. Here's receptors. Um, they're often found in the membrane of cells with their receptor sites facing out. Each receptor only binds to the ligand that it fits. Uh, ligands don't have to be chemicals. Sometimes they can be things like light waves in the case of photoreceptors. And sometimes receptor proteins might actually be in the cytoplasm if the ligand chemical is small and nonpolar. It might actually just cross right through the phospholipids and bind with the receptor inside. So that would be true of steroid hormones like, say, testosterone. But for the most part, we're going to assume that our ligands are binding at the cell membrane, and so that's what I'm trying to model here. Um, this might be the chemical ligand, and this might be the receptor that's specially shaped to fit it. And so the first step of any signaling pathway is that the ligand has to fit in the receptor protein's receptor site. Okay, so let's move on to step two, which is transduction. That's a very fancy looking word, but to transduce something simply means to convert it from one form to another. And so what we're really converting here is some kind of external signal that's being converted into a change in internal cell activity. So how does that start? Well, uh, the, what the has to be the first step in your story is that you have to connect the ligand binding to the receptor with how that might change something. And so that's gonna cause the receptor to change shape. And if you're talking about a membrane receptor, then it has to change shape inside the cell so that maybe a new binding site is opened so that the next step in the pathway can be activated. Almost always here we're talking about proteins that are going to be activated throughout this transduction pathway. And so um, we're going to talk about multiple ways here in just a second about how the next protein in the pathway might be activated. So I just want you to be able to tell me some of these, not necessarily all of them. So uh, one example is that maybe a kinase gets activated by a previous step and, the, and a kinase will activate the next protein in the pathway by phosphorylating it or by transferring a phosphate from ATP to that next protein. Uh, so maybe a kinase's binding site gets opened up and so the next protein can fit in it. 
um, and then it also fits ATP, and by phosphorylating its allosteric site, I know we've talked before about phosphorylating proteins to energize them here uh, in the past, but really what we're talking about here is just phosphorylating a protein to change its shape and maybe open up a new binding site for the next step in the pathway. So kinases can phosphorylate. In some cases, what we're activating in the next uh, step of the pathway is a transport protein. Um, often these transport proteins are gonna be embedded in the uh, organelle membrane within a eukaryotic cell. And by maybe activating or opening that transport protein, we're allowing some kind of chemical to diffuse out of that organelle and into the cytoplasm. This might especially be ions, for example, ions like calcium. And maybe that calcium can go then and bind at the allosteric site of the next protein in the pathway, and we've once again passed the signal on to the next protein. So uh, whenever we release a new chemical inside the cell to activate the second, uh, the next protein, we call that chemical a second messenger because it's kind of following the initial first messenger, which was the ligand. Okay, um, another possible way to activate the next step in the pathway is maybe the next protein is an enzyme. And maybe what that enzyme can do once it gets its shape changed is maybe its active site is opened and actually the substrate chemicals that come into it get changed into some kind of chemical products. Uh, maybe it's an enzyme that cuts up a bigger substrate into smaller products and that smaller product um, is actually sort of an active piece that can then go to the next step in the pathway. So an example here is um, um, in some signaling pathways, there's a, there's a protein called phospholipase C that maybe gets its shape changed by a previous step in the pathway. Maybe it's able now to go and bind to this chemical called PIP2. It's actually a bunch of phospholipids that are kind of holding a, an otherwise active chemical. And this enzyme can snip off that, that tether essentially and allow this chemical called IP3, now that it's free, to go bind to another protein in the pathway. So um, that's another way of activating the next step. The final way that I'll just briefly talk about is kind of just the opposite idea. Sometimes enzymes might activate the next chemical by putting together smaller substrates and sort of that combined whole is now able to bind at the allosteric site of the next protein and change its shape. Okay, um, so just to give you kind of an animated example of all of that in case it would help to see an example signaling pathway, uh, here we have our ligand bound to the receptor protein. Remember that the second step has to be that that causes the receptor protein to change shape. In this case, it has to change shape inside the cell. And maybe what that effectively does is it opens up a binding site in that receptor. So now something else can come into that receptor and get changed itself. Maybe as it turns out, that could be the next protein in the pathway. So maybe another protein comes in and maybe uh, our receptor could actually be a kinase. That was one of the, the ways you can activate the next step. So I'm showing here that our receptor is a kinase that phosphorylates that next protein. And when you phosphorylate the allosteric site of that next protein, it changes its shape, maybe to reveal a new binding site. So that protein can now leave um, and maybe that new protein is effectively an enzyme that now can collide with its substrate, which is some big chemical. Um, and maybe that enzyme actually speeds up the chemical reaction that cuts up that chemical. And maybe the cut up pieces, maybe the circle here is kind of effectively a, um, a molecule that can now bind at the allosteric site of this transport protein that's embedded in this organelle membrane. Let's say it's a vacuole. And maybe that changes the shape of the uh, transport protein such that it opens it and allows this calcium to diffuse out into the cytoplasm. And maybe that calcium can bind at the allosteric site of the next protein and uh, cause it to change shape. So you can really see the signaling pathways often involve multiple, multiple, multiple steps and activations. Um, my other brief comment is that the uh, signaling pathway can eventually be turned off. Maybe the initial ligand can fall off, and when it does so, the receptor protein will again change shape to kind of be closed again, and eventually all these guys can be deactivated who were previously activated. Okay, 
Um, so we're finally at the point where we can finish by talking about maybe what the cell wants to do as an intended response. And I'm just going to break this up into two broad categories. Maybe in some cases your book calls this the cytoplasmic response. Maybe we just want to activate some protein at the end of the pathway and that was kind of the protein we were trying to activate in the first place. Uh, so maybe there's just some protein that already exists. Maybe it could be a metabolic pathway that we're trying to turn on, let's say, or maybe some kind of transport protein that we're trying to open up. Um, it, it could also be just the opposite. Maybe we're trying to turn off existing proteins um, as a result of the signal coming in. Or maybe we're trying to go to the DNA code and actually change the rate of new protein production. Maybe we're trying to get the cell to make a protein that doesn't currently exist. And all I want you to know about that right now is that the final protein that will be activated at the end of the pathway is what's called a transcription factor protein. I want you to know that name, but we're going to talk about more about how they work in another unit. But essentially, a really quick thing is that each transcription factor has a certain shape to bind to a certain gene in the DNA code and maybe influence how much that, that gene is transcribed, which will ultimately influence how much protein is made. So transcription factors can be factors in how often the transcription of a gene takes place. Okay, so what we try to do in this video is talk about a very basic signal transduction pathway, how an initial signal from outside the cell gets translated into a change in inside the cell. And what I really want you to kind of think of as you go through a sample pathway in an essay is I want you to connect all of your steps, just kind of like a, a series of dominoes, one hitting the other, who activates the other, who activates the other. I want you to be really clear in your story how the chain of activations works.